You may have noticed that I'm expecting a baby. I'm really excited about it. And I hope the life she will have will be even better than mine. In many res respects, at least, that's quite likely. Her life expectancy will be higher than mine. She'll have access to better education. And she'll have a greater chance of becoming a top executive than me. But I have a concern many people share. Somehow I know that our well-being has improved at an environmental cost. And so I wonder, can we continue to progress at this rate, or will we be stopped by the natural limits of the Earth? Many of us feel we need to reach a balance, continue to progress, but ensure there are resources left for our children and grandchildren. And in fact, this idea of balance is not new at all. Rewind to about 2000 BC in China. There was a law that essentially said, don't cut down trees in spring, let them grow, and don't catch fish in summer, let them reproduce. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the Garden of Eden, an even older tradition. Did you know that Adam's task in the garden was to work it and guard it? Yes, both those things, work it and guard it. The order of words is no coincidence. Working or shaping the world to make it better for us is what we've been doing from the beginning, and we've become experts at it. But it's also our responsibility to guard it too, and that's where I think we haven't been so good. So how can we make sure we guard it too? Well, there are many opinions and solutions out there. Some people suggest we should simply decide to reduce our use and, say, protect species or areas of land. And that's for sure part of the solution. But how about this? Guard it as part of the way we work it. Today, the way we work our world is the economy. The economy is an incredibly powerful way for people to express their preferences and drive progress in areas that actually matter to them. So can we use the economy to guard and work our Garden of Eden? There are positive signs this is already starting to happen. Go to your local shop and you may be able to buy paper that's labelled FSC, which stands for the Forest Stewardship Council, just one of many schemes that try and show how you can work and guard a forest. The total market size for certified wood and paper products is $5 billion a year. Or enjoy a nice meal in a restaurant, and you may eat certified fish, the annual market size for certified agricultural products is over $40 billion a year. So if these markets are already emerging, do we need to do anything about it? Well, the problem is that beyond the world of products and commodities, like paper, wood, fish, or fruit, nature still offers us so much more that's still not really accounted for in today's economy. Take, for instance, the air we breathe. Everyone prefers to breathe clean air rather than dirty air. But can you show this preference through your economic choices? Not really. Air is just a public good that belongs to everyone. Clean air is a resource nature provides to us for free. It's not included on any balance sheets. As long as there's enough clean air to go around, it's all okay. Often, you have to wait till a limit is reached to realize something has a value. But then, how much is clean air worth and who should pay for it? And shouldn't we realize the value of clean air before it gets polluted? In 2005, there was a breakthrough in the way people thought about our natural resources a group of over 1,300 scientists from around the world agreed on the concept of ecosystem services. 
An ecosystem is a unit, like a forest, a mountain, or a wetland. It can even be a piece of cultivated land or a city. And an ecosystem provides a service when someone benefits from it. So if we take the example of a forest as an ecosystem, the services it provides may be wood, but it also stores carbon, cleans water, and controls erosion. The concept of ecosystem services is really helpful when you're trying to get business involved, because services can be bought, sold, or traded, and therefore they have a value. I work for an association of about 200 leading companies called the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And over the past decade, I've seen companies realize that they not only impact on ecosystem services, they also depend on them. Yes, all businesses depend on ecosystem services, whether they know it or not. For example, most, if not all, industries use water. The food, food companies rely on services like pollination and pest control. Other industries are not as directly linked to ecosystems like hotels or restaurants, but still impact and depend on them. Hotels need water, energy, furniture, landscapes, food, sometimes even snow or underwater species to keep their guests happy. And if you think of an industry that doesn't look like it's linked to ecosystems at all, like banks, you may be surprised. Today, even banks are starting to assess ecosystem risks before lending or investing. <coughs> Understanding ecosystems is not only about managing risks like, will my water supply run out? Will an NGO boycott my products? Understanding ecosystems is also an opportunity. You can save costs, find new markets, and develop products that better match your consumer preferences. Companies that include ecosystem value in their decision-making will make better decisions. If your business is hydropower, you should worry about the management of the forests nearby, because as I mentioned before, forests control erosion and keep sediments out of your reservoirs. If your business is to make laundry powder, your consumers will like your product more if it saves energy by working just as well at lower temperatures. But once you've realized that nature has a value and including it will help you make better decisions, how do you actually do the maths? It's not my intention to get into the nitty-gritty detail, but I wanted to say that there are many methodologies out there that have evolved and improved over the past 50 years or so. But to give you an example of how you can do the maths, let's look at the value of a wetland. Wetlands provide storm protection. They act like speed bumps, slowing down the speed and intensity of storms and hurricanes. In the Gulf of Mexico, before Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, wetlands were being destroyed for development. It cost about $200 billion to restore New Orleans after the hurricane. But there was a proposal to restore the wetlands before the hurricane that would only have cost $14 billion over 30 years. It was rejected because it was considered too costly, and today we wish we would have accounted for the true value of the wetlands before the damage was done. Sometimes people have made smart decisions beforehand, and a well-known example of this is New York City's tap water. Did you know that the water that comes out of New York City's taps has never been through a filtration plant? And before I go on, don't worry if you've drunk it, you'll be fine, it's completely safe. The Catskill Mountains watershed nearby filters the water naturally. In the late 1980s, the watershed was in really bad shape. So, 
the city considered building a filtration plant that would have cost between eight, six to eight billion dollars, not including operating costs. Instead, they decided to restore and conserve the watershed for just one and a half billion dollars. By saving the watershed, they saved over four and a half billion dollars. This example shows how you can put an ep economic value on nature by comparing the service it provides with a man-made substitute. Filter water in an industrial plant or let the watershed do the job for you. But other situations are not as straightforward, especially when you're trying to value aesthetic or cultural things that are very important to people, but also the tourism industry. And so we may need to think of other ways of putting a price on nature. How much is the beauty of a mountain like the Matterhorn worth? <coughs> if you asked people how much they would actually be willing to pay to preserve its beauty, some people would say nothing, but others, probably richer people, may say hundreds or thousands of dollars. You could also look at how much tourists do pay to come and visit the mountain and add up, say, their plane tickets, food and hotel. Or you could compare the property value of houses with a view on the mountain with ones that don't have that view. So there are ways of assessing an economic value of nature and doing so helps us make better decisions. In fact, some leading CEOs are publicly stating that they see the value of ecosystem valuation. And smarter laws and public policy are starting to emerge that include ecosystem value too. So, to recap, the problem is simple. This huge natural wealth we've been using for free is being degraded precisely because it's not being accounted for. Some experts say we're losing at least two to five trillion dollars worth of ecosystem services each and every year. Let's give ourselves the challenge that by 2050, our markets will incorporate the true value of ecosystems. If nature is a free, all-you-can-eat buffet, we'll end up in a big environmental mess. But if nature is truly accounted for, then the cheapest goods will also be the ones that are the most sustainable. By 2050, 4,000 years after the Chinese law I mentioned at the beginning, I believe we can reach this balance so many of us are looking for. But in 2050, my daughter will only be 38 years old, so we better get a move on. The dilemma, environment versus the economy, is so outdated. It's environment in the economy. And if we can do this, I believe we'll be on track to both work our world and guard it. Thank you very much. <laughs>